Hey, what's up? Welcome to Redefine Church. My name is Dusty Otis. I'm the lead pastor here. So thankful you're taking part of your day to join me. Make sure you keep up with us socially by liking or sharing the message. Subscribe to us on YouTube so you can get every update, every message that comes out. Uh, we believe this is a big deal. This is how the gospel goes forward right now as we're online. So make sure you grab your Bible and a notebook as we dive into the message. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you today, Lord. We ask that you just help us to posture our hearts in a way that we would receive. Open our hands, our ears, our eyes, our hearts to hear, to see, Lord, to, um, to understand, Lord. We love you. We thank you for this moment. Thank you that we leave changed, that we leave better than we came here today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to Dismayed and Afraid, week three, talking about how to uh, keep your morals, your values, your integrity from slipping. We're talking about the fear of losing your character. Cornerstone Scripture, Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear anything, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Be assured I will help you. I will certainly take hold of you with my righteous hand, hand of justice, power, victory, and of salvation. We know now, being in week three, in case you're just joining us, that fear is an unpleasant emotion, a feeling of anxiety caused by belief that someone or something dangerous is likely to cause pain or will be a threat. When it comes to your character, who is making you fearful? Dismay means consternation and distress, to, which is typically caused by something unexpected, which causes you to lose courage, to lose resolution because of fear. Who is making you dismayed when it comes to your character? A lot of pressure these days on making the right decision, making the right choice. And again, it's your decision to make the right decision. The key word there is right. The key word is right. And the biggest right that you carry is found in John 1.12. It says, To everyone who receives and welcomes Jesus, He gives the right, which is the authority and privilege, to become children of God, which means He restores you to the Father. You're now, you're, you're back. You're back in the fold. That is, to those who believe in and adhere to, trust in, and rely on the name of Jesus. Later on in John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus says, To you who walk in this right, to you who walk in this right, children of God, you are truly my disciples if you live as I tell you to. And when you live as I tell you to, you will know the truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It has a lot to do with your character and the depth of your discipleship, which is, which is why we do these. This is not about views or likes. It's not attendance. By the way, if you were ever going to share a message or finish a message, if you're a Sunday short person, this is the message to finish for you, for your depth in uh, tackling the number one thing that we all struggle with right now. And so then, when you accept and receive the right that we're talking about, because you've been redeemed, redeemed meaning that you have regained relationship with God because of the exchange for your sins that Jesus made with his life. When you accept and receive this right, Jesus, who reconnects you, now sees you as righteous. God, from above, calls you righteous. He sees you right in his sight is what that means. And so you see it in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30, lots of scripture off the top here. So if you're taking notes, let's go. You can screenshot as well. 1 Corinthians 1.30, but it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, revealing his plan of salvation and righteousness, making us acceptable to God and sanctification, making us holy and setting us apart for God and redemption, providing a ransom from the penalty of or for our sin. Now, let's go back to present day, trying to manage, you know, navigate through where we're at. When you're constantly pressured by people, you question your right and you question your righteousness. When people are pushing something to you, at you, or down your throat, you constantly wonder. You can't help it. Because they're not with you all the time. They're only with you to put this on you, right? And so then when people are working from an agenda to push something on you, it's easy for you to immediately go, what is right? Am I right? Is it right? And more importantly, we question our righteousness. Am I still aligned? Am I still good? And people, what you need to know is people who work from an agenda, people who are trying to force you to do something, will always do what is necessary for you to comply. It's, it's a must, right? Meaning, they will lie to you, they will deceive you, they will 
fear, cast fear and make you feel afraid. They will shame you. They will guilt you. They will do whatever is necessary because the people who are behind what is being forced or pressured or pushed on you, and that's anything, okay? The people who are forcing something know, know, based on disc profile, that 70% of the world is go with the flow people. We're not gonna, we're steady. We're not gonna rock the boat. We really don't like change, but if I absolutely have to, if you're telling me, then I will. And so then that's why it's so much in your face all the time. Now, now the people leading the charge know that, but at the same time, when your personal values, when your integrity is challenged, it will stop in your tracks and make you go, hmm, am I right? Am I okay? And it makes you question your right and your righteousness. And so, so much so that it causes those who are pushing something on you or at you to take the stair step approach. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back, right? And they come and they're gonna, they're gonna eventually meet you where you are to get you to come this way just a little bit. And then once they get you moving, they got you. They got you. And here's the thing, that the mask situation is a great example of this. What freedom will you trade? What freedom will you trade to me for a little bit of movement, right? And so then we've been back and forth, depending on what region you live in, what part of the country you live in. We've been back and forth on this all over the place. I don't have anything, any problem with a mask. Um, dry throat is dry throat, right? Chew a piece of gum. This is way bigger than a mask. Okay, so, so please don't read that. But the mask, um, the mask mandate is a great example of this. And it's a great example of this because it is, um, what one, what, okay, you can't do that. We're 15% open. We're 25% open, we're 50%, we're back to 35. We're here, we're there. If you'll just do this, we'll give you this, okay? So if you just do this inside, outside, you can, you can stand on top of each other, stack as close as you possibly can, breathe, slobber, all those things, right? Outside, outside it doesn't exist, but inside, it's very real. It's very real inside, right? And the problem is we've been going back and forth, back and forth, and there comes a point where people just go, enough, fine, 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 I'll do it. And so then you see that people, can, people are at a rate continually dropping off and, and trading their values and their beliefs, their morals, their ethics, right? Trading their character, trading their integrity for freedom. They're trading it for freedom. Well, if I do this, then, then, uh, then uh, at least we can do that. At least we have football, right? At least we can go sit in the stadium. And so then we're, we're constantly losing people of integrity and moral value, all those things. And when we do, we just kind of give them the old, lost another one, right? By the way, if it's that easy to lose somebody, did we ever really have them? And so then if you're going to make the right decision, what is right? What is right? And right is defined as morally good, justified, acceptable, true, or correct as fact. That's what right is defined by. This is a hope that we all have. We all hope that right is being done. A couple more if you're taking notes. Right is also defined of, as that which is morally correct, just, or honorable. It's the right thing to do. To restore to normal, upright position. We call this righteous. It's a correction. It's what Jesus did for us when he sacrificed himself so we could be re redeemed, right? Restored to normal, upright, righteous position. The other right is favoring conservative views. This is a, a political view or a way that somebody believes or votes, right? True or correct as fact. This is biblical truth. This is the only place that you're going to find that, okay? True or correct as fact. And the last one is a moral or legal entitlement to have or obtain something, or act a certain way. This is your right. This is your right. And your right defined as legal, social, or ethical principles of freedom or entitlement. That is, rights are the fundamental normative rules about what is allowed of people or owed to people according to a legal system, social convention, or ethical theory. Rights are essential 
uh, are of essential importance in such disciplines as law and ethics, especially theories of justice and nature. Rights are fundamental to any civilization. Rights structure the form of government, or though they should. They also structure the content of law and the shape of morality. That's what your right defined is. And so lots of clarity today around right and what is right. And so then now that we fully understand right, both spiritually and practically, the decision is the easy part, right? The action or process of deciding or resolving something or resolving something. And this is where we tend to have a little bit of friction. Well, that's not the right decision. Yes, it is. If it's rooted here, it's the right decision. And so here's the thing. Decision is the ultimate power. There's nothing above that. You can say money and you can say all these other things, but here's the deal. Decision is the ultimate power. That's why people constantly want your decision. That's why they're after you. They want power. Matthew 5, 37 tells us exactly how to make the right decision. It says this, let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, meaning a firm yes or a form or a firm no. Anything more than that comes from the evil one. Anything more than that, don't even worry about it, comes from the evil one. What am I saying? Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. When you make decisions this way, there's no justification needed for your answer. You don't have to justify Jack, right? Like the scripture said, nothing more. Plus, as a believer, you are already justified in your right decision. When you tell somebody yes or no, those statements, those statements are enough, period. And so then Romans 3, 23 and 24 tells you, since all have sinned and continually fall short of God's glory, nobody's perfect. I don't care how they look. Nobody's perfect. We've all fell. And are being justified. What? Declared free of the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God, and granted eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. As a gift by His precious undeserved grace through the redemption, which is the payment of our sin, which is provided in Jesus. What's Romans 3, 23 and 24? It's confirmation that you have been justified and you are redeemed. Your decision is your decision. You might hang on to that one. Now, for your character, we address character today because we believe what 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good character. Might highlight that one. What am I saying? If you say it, do it. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Here's the thing. Character takes integrity. Character takes integrity. Character is who you are when nobody is looking. Who are you behind closed doors? Does the showroom look just like the warehouse? Yes or no? Okay? Integrity is when what you say and what you do are the same. In other words, you're the same in public as you are in private, and your mouth matches your feet. It matches your hands. It's what you do. It's who you are. When these are out of alignment or they do not match, you have an issue with character. Okay? And if you need an adjustment today in the character department, the solution is a relationship with Jesus. If you don't know how to do that, please text me, and I'd love to start a conversation, get some dialogue going, and help you take steps in that direction. Remember, God's number one goal for you is to develop Christ-like character, that you would become like Jesus, it's what a follower or a disciple should be. It's why we do this online, even though we don't have a building, because we should be devoted to the teachings and the scripture. We should come together in the name of Jesus to get better, and you should get better. It's devotion, it's discipleship, it is community. That's who we are as believers, right? And so God wants you to be like his son because he set the ultimate example for us of what character, of what integrity is. Knowing that your character is everything, your character, which is who you are, is connected to your heart. So then your character is with you in every situation. Some of us like to block it out. Some of us like to, you know, small, whatever we got to do to compress it. But it's with you always because it's in your heart. It's in your heart. 
If you want to build character, you need to reference 2 Timothy 2.22, which says, Flee your youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call the Lord from a pure heart. This isn't automatic. It's not assumed. Yeah, I know that. No. If you want to build great character, start here. So then, here's the question. How are you today? If we were in person, this would mean a lot more, and so I apologize. How are you today? Here's what you get back. Good, fine, okay. I know all those answers. I know all those answers. How are you today? Second Timothy to do. Your character is connected to your heart. How is your heart today? Does who you are flow from your heart or from an idea? Are you as good? Here's what I want to know. When I ask how are you today, are you as good, fine, or okay as you were two years ago? Are you making the same types of decisions? Are you just as bold? Are you just as confident? Are you letting who you are shine through all of the hypocrisy in the world today? Are you growing? Are you maintaining? Are you sustaining? Are you draining? Are you riding the line? I'm just kind of riding the line. I'm just going with the flow right now. Meaning, you're not one way or the other. You're steady. You're holding firm to the gray, right? You're claiming purple. Is that where you are today? How are you? Do you need prayer? Do you need to have a conversation? I have an open ear, and I would love to know what you need. Please reach out to me. Do you have the boldness and the confidence today that you had two years ago? Is what you were saying two years ago what you're saying now? Do your actions match your words? What does God say about living in the gray? I really want to dig on this for a second when it comes to losing our character. What does God say about living in the gray? What does he say when our yes is a maybe and our no is a maybe not? When we aren't resolute in our decisions, what does God say? When we ride the fence and when we do for the approval of others, before we do for honoring God. What does he say? Let's go to Revelation 3, 15 through 17. Here's what it says. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold, which is invigorating and refreshing, nor are you hot, healing, and therapeutic. I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, spiritually useless, and neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth, rejecting you with disgust. This is getting serious because you say I am rich and have prospered and grown wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked without hope and in great need. Nobody's perfect. And what John is saying here is don't be a hypocrite. What's the opposite of hypocrisy? It's integrity. The opposite is integrity. And integrity is a forgotten virtue today. Ah, it's an old word. It used to be, you know, hot, flashy. Integrity, it's forgotten today. Man, can we please, can we please get back to integrity? Can we please get back to integrity? This year we were asked, um, before school, by the way, our school system um, is struggling uh, because of uh, the recent, the two, the two years that we've been through, okay, as far as numbers, all those things. And so we were asked, and they made a big push to say, hey, if we, go, if we go back to normal, if it's normal when your kids come, would you send your kids? We have three kids that would be in, in school. And we said, absolutely, it's vitally important. And, you know, obviously it would be a lot easier for us if, if we did that. Yes, we would, we would be back. And a week before, it has nothing to do with the school, okay? The staff and everybody at our schools is amazing. And a week before school is supposed to start, the county comes down over the school and says, no, you're going back to mask and you're going back to distancing. Now, we happen to believe that when you muzzle, and that's what a mask is, it's a muzzle, that's just real, that that is, um, that's a sense or a form of oppression, that it is abuse, 
And, and here's the thing, it's not about the physical. It's not about the physical. It is the mental and the emotional drain that it's putting on my kids, on our kids, right? And so then, because they did not keep their word, and it was, out, it was out of our school's control because the word was not kept. We kept our word, right? Now, that wasn't easy. We are in the hardest season of our life right now, by far, okay? But we kept our integrity, and, and we're homeschooling again, which three kids with a one-year-old homeschooling in the same house in three different grades is difficult, right? No complaints. We are honored to have our kids. And so as we do that, we get phone calls. Hey, are they? And I said, yeah, man, no, they're not. They're not, they're not in school. Oh, well, what happened? Well, you, well, we were told this and you're doing this. That's a lack of integrity. That's what that is. And, and I said, so I said, we're, we're going to stick to what we said. Oh, okay. Click acquaintances from around town. Hey man, our kids were really looking forward to being in school with your kids. Man, us too. Us too. But here's what we were presented. Here's what they're doing. These two, these two don't match. There's no integrity. In this, I hate it for our kids. They deserve better. And we kept our integrity. We did what we said we were going to do. We stayed true to who we are. And what stinks about today is integrity shocks people today. Shocks them. Isn't it tragic when we live in a time that people are more shocked by our integrity than our lack of it. People are more shocked by when we do something right than they are by when we do something wrong. Mainly because we find ourselves choosing convenience over integrity. We like easy. I love easy. I love it. But when I choose easy over who I am, that's wrong. That's wrong. When I shelf my morals and my values and my ethics and I shelf who I am because something would be easier, it would be a heck of a lot easier to pack our kids out of here and send them to school. It would allow us some freedom to actually do and build and be. Not for the sake of convenience. Not for the sake of convenience. So. I want to show you how much that we like easy. This is a survey that's taken in 2018. This, was, this is pre-pandemic. And this is a survey from American people on integrity or lack thereof. And so here's what you need to know. 76% of Americans say they will steal without feeling guilty. 64% of Americans say they will lie if it gains them an advantage. 53% of Americans say they would commit adultery, meaning cheat on their spouse, if the opportunity presented itself. Let me say this. If you're only 47% sure you're going to remain loyal to your husband or wife, don't get married. Okay? Paul says it'd be better if you didn't anyways. If you only got 47%, just, just hold off. Give the ring back, take it back, save your money, and don't. Okay? 41% say if recreational drugs were presented to them, they'd partake. 30% would cheat on their taxes if they knew they weren't going to get caught. And if everyone that was surveyed in this, in this lengthy survey, only 17% of them believe that sin is a violation of God's will. 17% of Americans believe that sin is a violation of God's will. And what's sad is we aren't shocked by this. There are a few of us who are like, jeez, man. But the reality is this just became an expectation. Because what do we do? We open our social feed. We want to see who did what today. How crazy can it get? How insane can it be? Now, 
We have to get to the root, right? And it's not so much that the general population does not live or act on integrity. The, the problem is when believers do not live with integrity. When believers don't live with integrity, it affects our entire society. The truth is, is our society is not in the shape it's in because everybody who does not follow Jesus does not do the right thing. Those who don't believe in Jesus aren't doing the right thing. Is that a surprise? No. Our society is in the shape that it's in because we as believers aren't doing the right thing. We aren't living with integrity or it slipped, it shifted. This is a monstrous challenge for us as believers. It's monstrous because we've given up ground, we've disengaged, we slipped into comfortable and we have conformed. And many of us have folded under the current pressures that surround us today for fear of being disliked. We'll talk about it next week. Even though Romans 12, 2 clearly tells us, do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed. Progressively changed. You're getting better. As you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. So it says here in Romans 12 too, that integrity comes with maturity. We talked about our immaturity last week. I hope you got that. That you will do the will of God, which is good and acceptable when you have integrity. Now, most of us watching, listening, the, the truth is we believe in doing things right. We believe in doing right. We believe in treating people fairly, right? We believe in being honest. We believe in being moral. We believe in being faithful. And you can believe in one hand and you can do in the other. And do your beliefs match your behavior? Does it come out in your actions? For those of us who may still not fully operate in integrity, here's a deeper look. It's that exactly. How does this pertain to your character? Integrity is when your behavior matches your beliefs. Having integrity means your beliefs are integrated, integrity are integrated in who you are. It's in everything that we do because everything that we do is who we are. Your behavior matches your beliefs. Now, there is a massive difference, obviously, between convenience and integrity. There's a big difference between your reputation and your integrity. Your reputation is being who others want you to be or, or what others or who others think you are. Your integrity is who you are. There's also a huge difference between your integrity and your popularity. Oh man, just need to feel more loved. A lot of the problems we have in the, in, in the world are because nobody loves anybody, right? And so because I haven't been loved and I'm not loved, I need attention, okay? When you trade your integrity for popularity, you're serving yourself. That's just true, okay? When you keep your integrity above everything, you're serving God. And the Bible says that pleases God. Hmm. Proverbs 11:3: 3, the integrity and moral courage of the upright will guide them. But the crookedness of the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Double minded, hypocritical, living in the gray. Lack of integrity. Proverbs 11:3. 3. Why is this Proverbs in here? Because most people, especially today, even based on the survey we talked about, grow up believing that the best way to advance themselves is to do whatever is necessary to succeed. Lie. You saw it. Lie, steal, cheat. Whatever is necessary for me to do the best, for me to be the best, get the best, whatever is necessary for me to advance, they do. I do, right? Now, I don't think in people intentionally wake up in the morning and go, I think I'm going to be a hypocrite today. <sighs> Feels like a good day to do that. I don't think that people intentionally wake up and want to be that. I, I believe it happens over time due to our selfish ambition to succeed. But praising God on Sunday and mocking him Monday through Saturday is the biggest reason people aren't coming to faith, especially the generation coming after us. And I believe our hope should be as believers that we would stand exactly like Samuel. If you want to read 1 Samuel 12 this week, 
it would be amazing for you. Samuel stood with integrity. I'm not sure if you know this, you remember this story, but Samuel's very old in 1 Samuel 12, he's, he's gray, he's standing there with his kids, he's, he's talking, and he's, he's, I just love that he's standing with his family, and he says this, he says, give me everything you have, right? Essentially, rip me apart. And he asked them, he says, I have led with you, have, have I led you with integrity? Have I been faithful? Have I been honest? Have I treated you fairly? Have I honored God? He asked them all these things. And then he says, here, tell me if I haven't, and I will repent right now. Tell me if I've been wrong, and I will repent right now. And here's what they say to him. You've always been honest. You haven't made anything hard on us. And he says, God's heard you. And I think how Samuel leads in this moment is how we should lead our lives. This should really be our attitude of prayer when we approach God. God, have I not been faithful? Have I not been honest? Have I not been fair? Show me God, right? Know my concerns. Where am I? Where do you see this? Have I not honored you? Have I honored you, God? And if not, we repent. We should all stand at the end of our life and with that chin up and that chest out, knowing that we are people of integrity because it's God's will for us to stand in that moment and one, he wants you to say, I had integrity. My beliefs and my behavior, they matched. They matched. And the only way to be a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife, right? The only way to be a CEO, a boss, a coworker, the only way to be a leader or a friend is to be a person of integrity. That's it. Have high character. Why? Here's, here's a thought. If you want something to chew on, if you can't live for God right now, how will you die for Him? Proverbs 10, 9 says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. I want to look at Psalms 15 as we wrap this thing up to prove it to you. If you want to keep your integrity, you want to start to get it back, Psalms 15 is your blueprint. Here's what it says. O Lord, who may lodge as a guest in your tent? Who may live continually on your holy hill? Verse 2. He who walks with integrity and strength of character and works righteousness and speaks and upholds truth in his heart. Integrity. What does he say? When your words and your actions align. Integrity. When your belief and your behaviors are the same. Integrity. Let's go to verse 3. He does not slander with his tongue, integrity, nor does evil to his neighbor, integrity, nor, does, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, integrity. In his eyes, an evil person is despised, integrity, but he honors those who reverence the Lord, integrity. He keeps his word, even to his own disadvantage, and does not change it for his own benefit, integrity. Verse 5, he does not put money, put out his money at interest. Integrity, meaning you can't bribe this dude. And does not take a bribe against the innocent. Integrity. And then the finally he says this, he who does these things will never be shaken. The message translation, this is 2021 language, that's why I'm going to share it with you. It says this, God, who gets invited to dinner at your place? How do I get on that guest list? This is the message translation. And here's the response. Walk straight. Act right. Tell the truth. Don't hurt your friend. Don't blame your neighbor. Despise the despicable. Keep your word, even when it costs you. Make an honest living. Never take a bribe. I will never ignore you. I will never ignore you if you live like this. It's Psalms 15. Look it up. He who does these things will never be shaken. If you have integrity, you will never be shaken because God's hand will always be upon you and he is always with you. You know why? There's a solid foundation under you. It's called a rock, okay? You can build your life on it. It's what God has put in your heart because you trust him to work on your behalf, not someone else. 
God will work on your behalf. Integrity is everything. Remember, the opposite of integrity is hypocrisy. A hypocrite is someone who acts like someone they're not. A hypocrite is someone who acts like someone they are not. Jesus was harder on hypocrites than he was on prostitutes, liars, or thieves. He was hard on, all of, on, on every hypocrite. And he was harder because he hates it. He hates hypocrisy. Jesus wants us to be people of our word. It's the last thing I'll show you today. This is mess, uh, Matthew 23, verse 1 through 3. It's out of the message translation. And here's what it says. Now Jesus turned to address his disciples along with the crowd that had gathered with him. Here's what he says. The religion scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. You won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses. Can't go wrong on what they're saying. What they're saying, they're good. They're competent. Okay? Can't go wrong. But be careful about following them. Be careful about doing what they do. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take it into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polish veneer. Their behavior doesn't match their beliefs. This is what happens when our decisions don't match our character. When you read on, in, uh, it would just be good for you to read this. For time's sake, I'm going to let it go. But you should, if you can find the message, go to BibleHub.com or you can go to BibleGateway.com. Look up the message. Go to Matthew 23, message translation, and read verses 4 through 12. Let me just tell you what uh, verse 11 and 12 say. Do you want to stand out? Then step down. You want to stand out? Step down. Be a servant. If you put yourself up, if you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. But if you're content to simply be yourself, your life will count for plenty. It's what John speaks about in Revelations 3, 15 through 17. Be hot or be cold. It's true of Matthew 5, 37. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. This is a big challenge. It's a humongous challenge to all of us because little things discredit us, especially as believers. So then, always make your decisions with integrity. Let them affirm your character. Let your beliefs match your behavior. And make them prioritize your peace first. When a decision is made like this, it is always, always, always the right decision. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word today, your heart for people. Lord, as we move through this series in this season, talking about fear and the place we live right now, Lord, I just ask that you would speak to people's hearts. Let this seed right here, this word, be nourishment to our souls today to check us right where we sit or stand as we listen, as we watch. Help us, Lord, to be people of integrity. The example of Samuel is amazing. Help us to be those people. Let that be our attitude in prayer, Father. Help us, Lord, to align our beliefs and our behavior. Let our words match our actions, Father. God, help us to bring salt and light wherever we go. Help us to be the church where we are this week. I love you, and I thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for being here today. I hope that our time together has been meaningful to you. I hope it's helped you move forward in your faith. You have greater insight, that you have a better uh, heart knowledge of who God is and what he wants for you in your life. If today's message meant something, I would just ask that you share it, send it on. This is how the gospel goes forward right now. If you're ready to take your next step spiritually, and I would love to hear from you. You can let me know if you need prayer today, you're ready to make a decision to follow Jesus. Um, you need to be water baptized, it's your time. You wanna be a part of what's happening here and uh, you believe this is your day to take your next step, email me at dusty at liveredefined.com. If you're ready to get involved, today's your day to say, you know, Dusty, I've been here, and I love what's happening, and I want to be a part of Redefined Church. I want to get involved. I want to do local outreach. I want to uh, be kind of on the front lines of what's happening in this, in this movement. And I would love to hear from you. Just text me. Text Let's Go to 313-636-1127. Make sure you keep up with us socially. Follow, like share if you're on youtube subscribe so you can always get what's coming out we're going to start doing more and more of this type of stuff and so you're going to want to be in the know on that if you give if you support our church thank you 
If today's your day to jump on board and be part of our mission to join the cause, you can give by going to churchredefined.com forward slash give. There you'll find safe, simple steps to give. We give because we value people. We want to see more people get in heaven because God values people. And so we give to see people get to heaven. And so if you're doing that today, thank you. We're believing that God's going to bless you richly in your finances, knowing he's going to meet every need and exceed them because that's what his promise is to us. As always, it's an honor to be your pastor, to help you move forward in your faith. If I can do anything ever, please email me. Let me know how I can be of assistance to you. I love you. Have a great week.